Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Matthias Wisser, and I am the director of the Car Center for Human Rights Policy here at the Harvard Kennedy School. And I am delighted to be welcoming Ken Roth uh, to this event here, who will be giving a talk called Human Rights and Technology, looking back at the last 30 years. Before I introduce uh, Ken, uh, let me uh, introduce one other person who will be joining us uh, at the Q&A stage. Uh, my co-moderator for today uh, is Albert Fox Kahn who is one of the current uh, human rights and technology fellows here at the at the cost center and um, uh, in addition uh, to that very absorbing role here he is also the executive director of an organization called stop uh, which is an acronym that stands for surveillance technology oversight project uh, and uh, the name once fully spelled out uh, speaks for itself in terms of what they do i, I encourage you all to Check this, check out their website in terms of getting a sense of what kind of work they do in order to exercise uh, oversight over surveillance technology. So he'll be joining me as a co-moderator today once uh, once Ken has given his talk. Uh, human rights and technology has been, as, as many of you will know, has been one of the focused areas that the CAR Center has uh, concentrated on in, uh, in, in, in recent years. Uh, because technology has been bringing changes for the human rights movement and has done so um, massive changes and has done so in different dimensions. Um, one of them is simply in, in terms of uh, what problems we are concerned with uh, and what the also often what the substantive content, at least on the on the margins of the rights is that uh, that are on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and that have been added to the human rights movement. Uh, over the decades, because the the document that we are grounded grounding this this all this work in, namely the Universal Declaration, was passed in 1948 when human experience was of a certain kind, uh, and this is now several decades later. And technological innovation has changed um, many things around us that also are reflected in terms of what we care about and what we talk about when we when we uh, obviously not not fundamentally we are. You know, not with human rights. We are talking about fundamental protections of and provisions for human beings. Uh, but on, certainly, on the margins, uh, technology has uh, ha has changed uh, quite a bit. And then, of course, technology has also changed quite a bit how human rights organizations can operate, what they can do. And so, <laughs> for all these reasons, human rights and technology have very much have been very much been the focus, uh, one of the focus areas for the Car Center. Uh, and I'd also just like to notice uh, in passing my own work on this uh, has fine, has now amounted to the publication of a book called um, Political Theory of the Digital Age, where artificial intelligence might take us, which just appeared about a couple of weeks ago. So this is all part of the larger um, framework of uh, work that we do here around on human. But with all that said, let me now turn to uh, Ken Roth, uh, who uh, in, in human rights circles, uh, really doesn't need an introduction, so I will definitely keep this thing very short. Ken uh, was the executive director of Human Rights Watch for almost 30 years until a few months ago, and he is um, one of the most visible, if not the most visible, human rights advocate of the of the present age. Um, so in, in that sense, really does not need an introduction. And what he will be talking about, again, is human rights and technology looking back at the last 30 years. And so without further ado now, over to you, Ken. Welcome to the screen. All right. Well, thanks, Matthias and, and Albert as well for, for hosting this conversation today. Um, and I will um, you know, open up with a few remarks, but really I look forward to, to a genuine conversation and a real exchange. Um, Matthias, you said that I was going to talk about the last 30 years, but I thought I would actually take a step even further back than that to put the last 30 years in a bit of perspective. Because, I mean, I think you've heard me say this, but I really do think that the evolution of the human rights movement closely tracked the evolution of communications technology. And, you know, the reason for that is, I think, pretty straightforward when you think about it. Uh, you know, the human rights movement is really built on the capacity of identifying wrongdoing, you know, mostly by governments, but sometimes by others, and um, shining a spotlight on it in order to shame the, the perpetrators, the abusers, into better behavior. But in order for that shaming to work, you need to know about the abuse in a timely way. 
and be able to compute, communicate about it um, so that the perpetrator can be shamed. And our ability to know about the world and to communicate to the world is obviously, if you think about it, a product of communications technology. And so, you know, as communications technology has evolved, it really has expanded our horizons, it's expanded what is possible for the human rights movement. And so, I mean, let me, let me give a sense of that. Um, and I want to go back to what I generally think of as the first two big human rights movements. And that is the movement to combat slavery and the movement for women's suffrage. And I think it's not an accident that those were the first big campaigns because each of them was a big, long lasting problem. It's not like you had to know, you know, what happened yesterday or what happened last week or even last month. You know, these were entrenched problems where it wasn't, you know, critical to know the latest news. And when you wanted to sort of disseminate your views or your opinions about these practices, it also wasn't, you know, essential to get the word out tomorrow. Um, these, you know, were long lasting problems that allowed long lasting campaigns to be pursued. And that was the only kind of problem or campaign that the human rights movement was able to wage. Um, to, to put this in a bit of perspective, um, Adam Hochschild talked about in his um, book on the, on the slavery movement in Britain, how a critical communications technology step was the emergence of fast postal delivery. I mean, literally, you know, the, the horses would, would drop off the postal bag in a quicker way than they did before. And that enabled the possibility of, you know, pretty much postage delivery within a day. And that, you know, enabled the kind of rapid organizing that the anti-slavery movement required. Now, the, the next, I think, big evolution was, was actually the telegraph. Um, which enabled war correspondence and for the first time allowed, you know, the beginning of a response to war. Um, and I think the, the two best known examples of this were um, the Crimean War, which took place um, in the 1850s, which I think is, um, is most often known for having given rise to Florence Nightingale's um, conception of modern nursery. Um, but it took her, you know, learning about the, the the deaths, the injuries, the, the 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 disaster of the battlefield, to know that she was needed and that there was something that nursing could address. Um, you know, similarly, it was um, the telegraph that enabled kind of the emergence um, around the U.S. Civil War of the Lieber Code, which was the first real effort to regulate um, military conduct in time of war, to move past the concept of total war to recognition that there were certain standards that should, um, you know, that should constrain um, the, the behavior of combatants. Now, you know, coming up more to modern time, Amnesty International really began what we know of today as the modern global human rights movement. Um, it was founded in 1961. And for, you know, its first couple of decades of existence, it followed you know, a very basic methodology. It, it had a relatively small team in London, and that team would try to monitor the world. Um, it would occasionally travel, but travel was expensive. And so it didn't happen that often, maybe once a year. Um, and it would, you know, occasionally use the phone, but international phone calls were prohibitive. And so people wrote letters. And, and it was literally, you know, writing to a government official and could you give me the latest word on, on such and such a prisoner or writing to his or her family. Um, you know, this was slow. And so your, your classic um, report was, you know, was retrospective, um, would come out occasionally, didn't pretend to be timely, but was trying to address, you know, kind of broadly speaking, the kind of abuses that this sort of sporadic, um, slow communication would make possible. Now, um, I, I've joked about this, but in many ways, I remember kind of a revolutionary communications technology emerging, and that was the fax machine. 
you know, and, and we joke about faxes. I mean, who, who uses faxes anymore? But faxes were um, revolutionary at the time because it enabled conveying you know, an entire page of information or you know, several pages. So a lot of information for the cost of a relatively short international phone call. You know, people could afford to do that. And, and you know, suddenly um, information was coming in, in larger quantities and in a much more timely way than phone calls made possible or, or, or certainly than the mail. And, and then, um, you know, it got to the point where there were literally efforts to smuggle fax machines behind the Iron Curtain so that the dissidents in the Soviet Union or Czechoslovakia or whatever, um, you know, could get word out on the fate of their colleagues. Now, um, you know, we laugh about that, but the, um, the next big evolution was um, email. And when I think about, you know, how did that transform Human Rights Watch, uh, the, the most famous campaign that it enabled was the campaign to ban anti-personnel landmines. And, you know, this was the first time an effort was really made to build a global coalition of, of NGOs and ultimately a global coalition of governments who were willing to, you know, fight back against the major powers because, you know, the U.S., Soviet Union, China, they didn't want a landmines treaty. You know, they were perfectly happy to continue using landmines. And so it took, you know, initially an NGO coalition putting pressure on, you know, a group of ultimately about 60 small and middle-sized governments that band together, decided to sort of, you know, when the UN route to a treaty was blocked through intransigence, they moved outside of the UN. And that was the Oslo process that led to the treaty. Um, but the kind of rapid communication, the, the strategizing, the, the, you know, the quick um, exchanges that were required for a successful campaign like that were enabled by email. It would not have been possible a few years earlier. The other, you know, big thing that email made possible was real-time reporting. I mentioned how, you know, a classic amnesty report, or for that matter, a classic Human Rights Watch report up until that time, was retrospective. Um, it would, you know, purport to describe what was happening over the last six months or a year. But it was just out of the question to write a report about what happened today. Communication was just too slow and cumbersome. But, but suddenly, email made that possible. And that um, you know, allowed human rights work not simply to be addressed to the abuses of the past, but to look at what was happening today and to try to prevent the abuses of today from recurring tomorrow. And that, you know, just to give an illustration of how that played out um, organizationally, Human Rights Watch at that point, we created an emergencies team. It's currently called our crisis and conflict team. But this was a group of researchers who actually were not assigned to one particular country. They were researchers without portfolio, but they really specialized in this kind of wartime reporting because we would send them into a conflict zone and they would try to monitor that conflict and just, you know, day to day change the course of the war in order to spare civilians. All of this, you know, entirely made possible by, by email. I should say that this um, movement to email also pushed us to do shorter reports, which just makes sense. You know, if you're if you're doing a retrospective over the you know what happened in the last year, these tend to be long book length reports. But if your aim is to stop abuses by tomorrow, you can't do that with a book. So we we began you know putting out really for the first time bulletins, you know, just news releases, short things enough to demonstrate the facts for our conclusion but not purporting to be comprehensive at all, but just saying, look, this is a problem. This is what happened today. We've got to change it tomorrow. So, you know, it really changed the ambition of the human rights movement in a way that, you know, stays with us to this day. Now, the, the next big evolution that I'll spotlight was the emergence of social media. And here, um, I mean, there were a number of, of results of social media. Um, one is that it was obviously much more difficult for governments to hide their abuse. I mean, if you sort of think about, you know, say the, the Khmer Rouge atrocities in, in Cambodia, where the world really didn't know what was happening as some 2 million people were killed over a few years. It's inconceivable that something like that would happen today where, you know, so many people have smartphones, 
And so many people have access to social media and they can just get the word out and often get it out visually, not just you know, the written word. So, um, you know, suddenly our ability to know about things was greatly increased by the emergence of social media. Um, similarly, our ability to um, disseminate our findings or our views was greatly facilitated because until social media, we really needed to maintain lists of journalists to whom we would send, you know, on this or that country or issue. And you're always trying to update it, but it's, you know, it's very time consuming and it's never comprehensive. And, and suddenly, you know, while we would still do that, we would still keep email lists. Suddenly you could just post on social media and journalists or diplomats or just interested members of the public from around the world, you know, people who you don't even know can suddenly, you know, get immediate access to your, your work. Now, you know, obviously they could have gone to your website, but people don't tend to go to websites, you know, but, but when something shows up in their social media feed, they immediately learn about it. And so it made this kind of, you know, dissemination, which is so important for intensifying the shaming spotlight, it made that much, much easier. Now, there was um, a time when, you know, I thought that social media would also transform conversations in autocratic states, you know, that it would simply be impossible for governments to, you know, censor all these individual commentaries of people on social media the way they could censor a more finite number of, of, of traditional media outlets. That turned out not to be the case, you know, led foremost by China, which invested, you know, not only massive amounts in the Great Firewall, which was designed to prevent access to the, to the web, to the internet, but they actually, you know, did something that I didn't think was going to be possible. Um, they figured out how to monitor and suppress statements on social media, you know, in part using artificial intelligence, but using really massive person power to um, to monitor this and even to, you know, to go after the inevitable Chinese tendency toward creativity to figure out, you know, how to use words or phrases or synonyms to evade the censors. Um, you know, we've also seen increasingly governments willing to simply shut down social media, although with interesting limits to that. I mean, the fact that, you know, today, Vladimir Putin, while he does everything to control the information environment in Russia, still doesn't dare to control either YouTube or Telegram, you know, both of which are available to people in Russia and are a principal source of independent information because all the traditional media has been shut down. So, you know, there is still a bit of a cat and mouse game there, but it is, um, you know, much more restricted than one might have hoped for at the, at the emergence of um, social media. There also, you know, was much talk about, um, particularly if you go back to, you know, 2011, the Arab Spring, the Tahrir Square uprising in Egypt, how social media would transform social movements. And, you know, for a while it looked like, you know, Facebook was the way to organize things, you know, that you start posting on Facebook and people show up in Tahrir Square. And it made possible this mass mobilization, you know, without an obvious set of leaders whom the autocrat could pick off and jail. And so that was, you know, the great promise of, of social media as an organizing tool. But as time went on, we also saw that there was, um, you know, a real limit to that because while, you know, by design, it was producing leaderless social movements so the leaders couldn't be targeted, the lack of leaders meant it was difficult to sustain a social movement. And it's very difficult to get people to turn out day after day in the streets. And that lack of leadership meant there was a lack of sort of, you know, professional knowledge of expertise, of the ability to really, um, have sophisticated, sustained policy recommendations for governments, you know, to really um, have something that the social movement was pushing for. So, you know, social media ended up being, you know, a nice organizing tool, but clearly what was not sufficient. Now, the other thing that I want to mention about social media has to do really on, on the research and the presentation side. Um, traditionally, I mean, until really just, you know, this past decade, um, research involved in sending people into the field to interview victims and witnesses of human rights abuses. Social media um, began to change that. I mean, initially it was really just the technology of satellite imagery where, um, you know, there are a handful of companies, Human Rights Watch worked very closely with Planet. Um, and what, you know, what Planet does is sends up these micro satellites, you know, 80 or so in a single rocket ship, they, they disperse. And they now take 
a picture of the entire world every single day. And so what that enables, it, it's really like a time machine. I mean, you could say, we'd like to see the imagery for you know, this particular area. Um, and we'd like to see it over these five days in, in, in the month of January. And they just give it to you. you know, and suddenly you can see you know, changes on the ground. And, and you can't see everything from a satellite. You, know, you can't see inside buildings, but you can see quite a bit. And this, um, you know, certainly bigger things like, um, you know, destruction of, of, of houses or, or territories or arson attacks or, or even, you know, sometimes um, killings and mass graves and the like began to be visible by, by satellite imagery. And then where social media came in is what's, you know, today known as open source analysis. But the capacity developed to scrape social media, you know, to look at the photographs and the videos that people had posted on social and to collect them and figure out, okay, you know, who took a picture or who took a video of this particular scene where there might've been a massacre or some kind of atrocity. Um, you always had to verify that stuff because, you know, people can put garbage on social media, but um, you could verify, you know, testing it against testimony, testing different videos against each other, and always testing against the satellite imagery because you knew the satellite imagery was true. That was not concocted. That was from a reliable source. And so, you know, this not only changed what was possible, it began to change what was expected. And, and so today it's almost as if the media, you know, it's not enough just to read a report about what people are saying happened. They want to see the pictures. And, you know, whenever possible, we oblige. But this is, you know, all relatively new. It's required new investment in people with new kinds of skills. Um, and, and it's, I think, you know, a great um, new frontier for the human rights movement. The, the one other thing I'll, I'll mention in terms of what we call visualization, um, and that is, you know, presenting findings, not just through a report and not just through photographs or videos, but actually through reconstructions. And this is, you know, again, just a possibility of kind of new, almost, you know, I guess you call it architecture software. But it's something that Human Rights Watch has done, you know, for example, um, during the, um, the George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter protests, there was an incident in Mott Haven in the South Bronx, where the New York City police engaged in what's called kettling, which is they would surround the protesters, they would trap them, and then they would arrest them and beat them. And, you know, Human Rights Watch didn't have a researcher on the site of this. But we, many people, you know, did take videos with, with their phones. We were able to collect all these videos. And then to make it real, we not only, you know, kind of put the videos together, but we actually did a, a three-dimensional model of this area where the kettling took place, you know, working with a group called C2. And this, you know, model made it all come alive. You know, it just made it so much more vivid because it, you know, it was almost as if you were there. Um, Human Rights Watch just did this with um, the Russian cluster bomb attack that took place on the Kramatorsk train station a few months ago in Ukraine. And, you know, again, we were able to collect, you know, we went to the scene of the crime, we collect visual evidence, but we then reconstructed it to show, you know, what does it mean for a cluster munition to open up and spread their submunitions over a wide area? with you know, hundreds of people below who would crowd it at the station to try to evacuate from the area. And this just, you know, it's a new way of presentation, but it makes it much more powerful. It allows you to, to you know, be there. And, and we're in the process of doing something similar with Mariupol to allow people to see you know, what does an utterly destroyed Ukrainian city look like? Um, and, and really to almost you know, weave your way through the streets um, to, to, to understand in a more visceral way what that's like. Now, you know, obviously you know, a big challenge with social is that it's not just the good guys who use it. You know, it, it, um, it also, is, as we all know, has been a real source for misinformation, for disinformation. And, you know, the same merits of social media that, you know, anybody has access, anybody can, um, can get their word out. Um, you know, that's good if the, the anybody is a witness to a human rights abuse. It's bad if the anybody is a propagandist for an autocratic government that is just trying to deceive you. Um, and you know, while in the old days, those governments would have to go through traditional media, 
Um, so they would, you know, to some extent, be limited by good faith journalists and editors. Today, there's no need for those kind of intermediaries. You can broadcast into the world yourself. And that, you know, that has become a problem, a problem only, you know, exacerbated by the tendency of many of the social media platforms to use algorithms that, you know, as we all know, prioritize engagement. And often the false, the exaggerated, the hateful is very engaging. So it, you know, rises on the um, algorithmic scale. Um, now, it's interesting that the Supreme Court is, is looking at, you know, whether social media platforms deserve to continue to be free of liability for postings. Um, and, you know, the, the basic question is, you know, is the social media platform, is it like the post office or the phone company where, you know, it'd be silly to sue the post office because, you know, somebody wrote a hateful letter, you know, or is it like a publisher, you know, where they review the book and, and if they put it out and it has defamatory material, you can sue the publisher. Um, and, you know, much of the social media platforms do indeed look more like the post office, but the algorithm looks more like the publisher. And it's going to be interesting to sort of see, you know, whether the Supreme Court ventures into this area, but also, you know, whether the platforms begin to take seriously their responsibility, you know, not just to post or take down, which is, I think, too um, black and white, but rather, you know, the, 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 the duty to address algorithmic promotion of certain material. Because um, if, you know, if they don't promote this material, yeah, there'll be, you know, fewer consumers, you know, it'll be less engaging, less profit for them, but more responsible, uh, you know, more responsible approach. So this is, you know, an area where the the, the terms are still being worked out. I think that, you know, there's real need for standards, um, but it is, um, you know, a new and interesting area. The other, of course, big question is, you know, broadly categorized under content management. And here, you know, I think it's safe to say that no social media platform is investing adequately in content management, particularly in um, you know languages other than English and situations outside the United States, and and if you look at you know the, their tendency to to just subcontract to people who are you know overworked, who are you know not well paid employees of of Meta or whatever, but are um, you know just churning through posts, um, the platforms you know wealthy as they are are not putting what they need into this kind of content management. Now. Um, I'd like to just take a quick turn to artificial intelligence, and um, which you know is a technological development that really is, I think, posing big new challenges to the human rights movement. Um, you know, some of these I think are well explored at this point, although not solved. But the obvious ones of, of bias, you know, which you know, if you put racial discriminatory material into an artificial intelligence program, you know, that's what you're going to get out. And, um, you know, this is an area, for example, where Human Rights Watch has worked on the matter of bail. You know, for the longest time, the view was, oh, you know, we have to take the bail decision away from judges because they're just too discretionary and biased and you just can't get fair bail decisions. Let's go to something more scientific. Let's go to an algorithm. And then when people started looking at the algorithms, they saw that, you know, this just replicated the bias because, you know, the the they tended to show, for example, you know, more crime from certain areas. So people who were coming from those areas were more likely to be denied bail or get or face a you know a high bail. But those areas were also the places where the police deployed because they thought there was more crime. A lot of this had a racial dimension to it. And so um, you know, it, it became clear that unless you had you know much more transparency in the development of these algorithms, um, it was going to be very difficult to fight the inherent unfairness in them. Um, Human Rights Watch also has been doing quite a bit of work on, you know, kind of a less um, followed aspect of artificial intelligence, and that is the um, emergence of what are known as autonomous lethal weapons, or um, what we say killer robots. But um, artificial intelligence has made it possible, or is in the process of making it possible, to develop a weapon where you sort of, you know, put in certain instructions, you know, look for this kind of person or this kind of tank, and you send it out, you know, without a human in the loop, without a human really, you know, pressing the trigger at the final moment. Um, but it just, you know, finds what it thinks is the target and it destroys it. So this is, you know, different from a drone per se, because drones um, still have a human controlling them. They have, a, you know, somebody who's deciding whether to press the trigger or not. But a fully autonomous weapon, once it's launched, would be on its own. 
And, you know, do we want to trust algorithms or computer programs um, to be able to make these life and death decisions without a human in the loop? And, and Human Rights Watch has been pushing very hard to develop, you know, binding standards on this, ideally preventing the emergence of this technology in operational form. Um, still very much a work in product. Uh, and there is quite a bit of pushback from the predictable, you know, advanced militaries. Um, one final thing I want to mention, um, and this has to do, I mean, Matthias was talking about, you know, the Universal Declaration and the need to upgrade standards. Um, I mean, yes, a lot of these standards were at least, you know, initially interpreted in a different era. So, you know, I often like to think about the right to privacy. And, you know, we tend to think traditionally is the right to privacy of, you know, something you do in your home or something you do on a, you know, private communication. But, you know, once you're out in public, sort of by definition almost, we say you don't have a right to privacy. And, you know, the, the law in the United States around the Fourth Amendment, which is the one that, that codifies the right to privacy in the, the U.S. Constitution, you know, has basically used this concept that, you know, if you, you know, once you go public with something, you give up your right to privacy. And they've even gone so far as to say, you know, they, that your metadata is not private because you shared the metadata with the phone company or with the internet company. Now they're beginning to back away from this, but you know this was an old-fashioned idea that you know when you when you dialed in your old phone and you're sharing those numbers with the phone company, you've lost your privacy in that, and so you know the FBI can monitor those numbers. They can't listen to your phone call without a warrant, but they need no warrant in order to just get all the numbers that you dialed. Um, you know, similarly, if you're walking through the street, um, police can can follow you, um, and you know you're out in public, so you don't have the right to privacy. But there was a limit to what they could do because it's very hard to follow somebody without being detected. And so given the massive resource allocation required, um, not that many people got followed. Today, though, when you know we all walk around with our mobile phones and our mobile phones are basically tracking devices, which can determine our location and record our location through our entire lives. Um, and you know what you do day to day is extraordinarily revealing about who you are and, and many aspects of your life that, that you would have thought were private. And so I do think we need to, I mean, this is just one example, but we need to develop a concept of privacy in public. You know, to what extent should there be limits on the ability of the government or others to collect data about you, even you in public, you know, your public life, because, you know, suddenly the fact that it's so easy to collect all this and piece your life together has meant that, you know, we are no longer safe by just the expense of following us. It's simple to follow us now. Um, and we need something better to protect us. So this is all to say that I do think we need standards, and I'll conclude here. Um, but there's a big question as to what is the best way to develop standards. And, you know, having been involved in various treaty processes and the like, these are slow. They tend to produce the lowest common denominator. They um, often, you know, in a, in a fast-moving area like technology, will be you know, overtaken by events, outdated before they're even published. And so I don't have a lot of faith in a treaty process to solve these issues. Um, you know, I think we need something that would involve more active monitoring. And you know, that could be a super empowered regulatory agency staffed you know, not with government bureaucrats, but with real techies who have the capacity to keep up with and, and you know, quickly put out new regulations dealing with new technologies, um, I think they need to be supplemented by civil society, by people who develop this expertise outside of government and can you know, monitor and, and really shame misconduct. Of course, the big problem here is access to information. And there's so it's so difficult often to get inside of these tech companies because for proprietary reasons, they don't want you inside. So I think this is the challenge that we face. But um, I do think we need to come up with a, a, a method of more active monitoring and active regulation than any current model um, permits. So I will stop there and, and I look forward to our conversation. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Ken. This, uh, this was uh, immensely illuminating, especially the, the fascinating historical sweep that you had going Going back uh, to the to the really the the origins of the human rights movement and the anti-slavery campaign and the uh, the women's emancipation campaign, then bringing us all the way up to the, the current age. 
Um, one thing I um, was thinking when you when you were talking about uh, how much how much it matters that we actually have images available um, for things is I kept thinking at the the famous uh, I think uh, I forget whether they're drawings or etchings what Thomas Clist about the about of slave ships right so in the as part of the anti-slavery movement in the 18th century there you know there was William Wilberforce who gave all these speeches in the British Parliament but then there was also Thomas Clarkson who went to the pubs in places like Bristol and talked to sailors what it actually what it's actually like to be on a slave ship and he produced these very you know these very eerie uh, images of a slave ship just to actually convey to people uh, what this was like and to motivate people in ways in which uh, words can and of course this is entirely different and has changed completely through technology, uh, you know, what is possible that, uh, today. I'd like to encourage the audience, some of you have done this already, to put your questions uh, in the in the YouTube chat. We will bring them in, but I'm going to turn over now to Albert. Well, Ken, thank you so much for, for the fascinating overview. And I want to start off with a question about the historical uh, progression here, because one thing that struck me is that a lot of the technologies that you were detailing as, you know, indispensable to the human rights movement as being so vital in holding human rights abusers accountable have also been used to fuel human rights abuses and you know you discuss this in the case of social media but i was also thinking about you know terrestrial broadcast yes it helped mobilize the world against uh um, you know, atrocities in the Balkans, but it fueled atrocities in Rwanda. Looking back even earlier, you know, thinking about lantern laws in the United States used to help uh, promote uh, slavery. And, and so I, I'm just wondering, how do you wrestle with that dual legacy of technology, both as uh, something which helps fuel human rights abuses, something which can hold abusers accountable, and, uh, you know, something which can also be used to target the activists, you know, speaking up uh, to against injustice. Of, of course, the long legacy of surveillance of civil rights leaders being part of that. I mean, Albert, you're completely right. All of this technology is simply double-edged. It, it's not, you know, completely positive or completely negative. And, and there's no disputing that. Um, you know, personally, I think that it's a net positive, um, you know, because I, I think that the our greater ability to hold governments to account that is made possible by communications technology um, produces better results than if there was not that accountability, even granted that governments can misuse the same technology. You know, I mean, your, your, your Rwanda example is a perfect one. I mean, you know, Radio Mil Colin, which is just a traditional, you know, radio station, was used to mobilize people to commit the genocide. Um, but it's, um, you know, I tend to believe that, you know, we're much better off not having governments operating in secrecy. And that's true for, I think, any institution. And, and you know, of course, the governments and institutions can use the same technology to disseminate their point of view, to try to, you know, spread propaganda, spread disinformation. <clears throat> but we then have, you know, we can fight back against that. <clears throat> we, you know, we have access to the same media that they do. Um, and so th I think there's no escaping the need to, to, to push back, you know. But I, I, it's a net positive, in my view, overall, that you know, without this ability to, to peer into the, you know, the back offices of a government institution, we, um, they would do whatever they wanted, and we would be in a much worse place. Interesting that you have such a uh, such a such a clear sense about the the net positive there, uh, because if I you know look back at the you know, the last 20 years or so of technology discussion has always been a bit of a pendulum, you know, so the optimism has dominated, the pessimism dominated at other times. In recent years, it seems to have been more the pessimism that has dominated and what is often referred to two things that often come up in as the private sector domain, the kind of work that Shoshana Zuboff has done on uh, on surveillance uh, capitalism, which basically argues that all our lives are getting commodified because we're emanating all these. I mean, you, you talked about that, how difficult it was to for anyone to be followed in the past. So now we have the time through our electronic interactions, right? And Shoshana Zuboff describes that in terms of the commodification of human life and things that is just a development in the completely wrong direction. And of course, as far as states are concerned, uh, we're getting references to China, you know, the social scoring model in China, and you know, China has just has done something absolutely astronomical there in the last ten years to, to 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 create this level of surveillance for its citizens, and lots of countries are interested in doing that. 
but yet you come out on net positive with this, Ken? That's, uh, is this, is, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, the reason is, and maybe this is partly just my temperament. I mean, do tend to be you know optimistic about these things, but um, you know, I do view the human rights movement as um, as a constant battle. You know, I don't believe that we're you know always progressing toward better and better human rights practices. That's just not life. You know, um, and so governments are always going to be you know coming up with new reasons to commit human rights violations. Companies as well. Um, we have to fight back. That's just the inevitable task of the human rights movement. Um, the reason I tend to be optimistic is that I do feel that we have much greater tools to fight back with than um, than we did in the past. You know, if you know, take Xinjiang. I mean, you're alluding to you know the really kind of the most intense um, state surveillance program in the world right now. Um, so it's not just the social credit system that that you described, which was you know sort of being rolled out across China, but seems to be slowed down a little bit now. But you know, within Xinjiang, where you know, the police literally have this handheld devices that, that Human Rights Watch um, reverse engineered that that have 11 pages of data on every single Uyghur, you know. And so, you know, yes, they're able to do that with a, you know, a fairly isolated minority with whom, you know, the majority of Han Chinese don't identify. Um, and, you know, could they get away with that in the rest of China? I doubt it. You know, they may try, but I think there'd be significant pushback. Um, but even, you know, within that very closed space, the technology gives us access in ways that, you know, we wouldn't have had otherwise. And it, it sometimes is funny. I mean, I, I, I love this story where on, on the Chinese version of Google Maps, I, I think it's Weibo, um, they, you know, somebody got the idea that, oh my goodness, if somebody looks at, at you know, Weibo Maps, they can find all the detention centers for Uyghurs. You know, we better blotch them out. And so, you know, some brilliant person blotched out all the, the detention centers. And so you could just go to Weibo Maps and look for the blotch outs, you know, and then go to Google Maps and, and you know, see a clear picture. So, um, you know, the, the, this technology is double-edged. And I think that um, ultimately the human rights movement does depend on our ability to mobilize public condemnation, you know, to develop public morality. And to mobilize that morality to to condemn or to shame governments, and um, in these new areas, you know, we're not going to be able to do that without revealing what's happening. You know, if it's all happening in secret, the public's not going to have strong views, and the government's going to get away with it. But if we can generate outrage at this, you know, whether it's you know Shoshana Zuboff's surveillance capitalism or you know the social credit system in China, you know, whatever it is, um, we have to know about it first, and then we can help to really, I think, develop the sense of right and wrong in the public that can lead to pressure for change. And that's that's our task. You know, it's not easy, but that's what we have to do. One thing that makes me wonder about is we've seen all of this pressure towards decentralization of the digital commons, the move to federated social media platforms, of course, Twitter's demise being one of the things that uh, has accelerated this. Well, it's not dead yet. <laughs> Do you have concerns about the ability to mobilize, uh, you know, at a mass scale in a world where we are increasingly in federated and and potentially siloed uh, uh, digital spaces where we don't have that shared uh, collective commons anymore? Yeah, I mean, I think it is. We're still very able to mobilize broadly. I think, though, Albert, your question is really even if you do mobilize, is there this, you know, separate information space of people who just don't read any of your media and, and who then are, you know, somehow immune to what you're saying within, you know, within your domain? I'm not, you know, that is obviously a problem. I think it tends to be exaggerated. I think there's much more kind of cross reading and cross awareness than, than we tend to describe. Um, but it is, I mean, I, I look with frustration today at Russia where there is, you know, a significant segment of the population that still believes that, you know, Putin is just reclaiming historic Russia and this was NATO that that started the war. And, you know, and I think they genuinely believe this. Now, I do think it's a losing proposition because, uh, you know, if they believe it because Putin has been able to create a closed information space to some extent. So if you get all your information from Russian TV and you just are, you know, bombarded by this propaganda, that's what you think. But there are many Russians who are figuring out what's really going on. 
And you know whether it's using Telegram and YouTube, which I alluded to, or using VPNs to just get past the sensors, um, you know, if you want to know what's happening, you can know what's happening. And um, and we see, you know, very significant resistance to the invasion and to the subsequent war crimes. Um, that those protests have now been quelled through sheer repression. But when you know, in, in the early days of the war, it was I don't know, like 40, 50 cities across Russia where there had been protests. So um, you know, it is possible to break through this, and it doesn't. You know, it, it, our task isn't to convince you know everybody on the other side. You know, and I, I think we you know sometimes forget that. You know, so there, you know, even in in the United States, I mean, the thirty percent of the people who are going to vote for Trump, regardless of what he does, you know, whatever. Um, but you know, if we target the movable middle, um, which is I think where we should always be aiming, these are people who do to some extent consume the same media. And and you know maybe not exclusively but sufficiently that you can get word to them and and you know government policy tends to a significant extent to be determined by this movable middle so I, I guess I'm less pessimistic than those who feel that they're completely separate information environments and the one doesn't talk to the other I don't think in practical terms that's where we are let me in a question from the audience at the stage um bob wyman is asking uh about uh, whether article 19 of the universal declaration is a good foundation for social media and online standards so this kind of goes back to the theme of um you know the universal declaration being from 1948 captures experiences as, as we had them then is this still uh is this still adequate for what we need to deal with today let me just read to you i mean for the mostly for the benefit of the audience what article 19 says Everyone has a right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Ken, is this still good enough for uh, a landscape shaped by social media and yeah. online standards? Well, Matthias, let me, if I could, supplement your question, because actually I think the real article is 20, not 19. In other words, 19 states the positive right and 20 states the limitations. And it's really the limitations that matter here. And and twenty, you know, for our purposes, outlaws advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence that shall be prohibited by law. So it's you know there's a requirement of governments to limit that. Now, um, you know, that's pretty good. I mean, a lot of the hate speech that we're concerned about um, would be covered by that. You know, it um, it doesn't you know explicitly deal with um, hate speech of a gender quality, so it could be supplemented in that sense. It doesn't um, explicitly deal with just mere misinformation or disinformation. Um, and so I, you know, there it would be helpful there. But I, you know, I don't anticipate, insofar as this ever gets to a court, you know, and if a court were to read Article 19 and 20 together, I don't think any court is going to you know stop a social media company from imposing sort of serious content management efforts with respect to, you know, broadly speaking, misinformation, even if it's not explicitly prohibited by Article 20. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, would it, would it be helpful to develop standards here? I mean, I think people know what the right thing is to do. I think the question is more just, can we get the platforms to do it? And, you know, having, you know, I, I suppose there's some regulatory body with a little clout, you know, pressing them to do it would be, would be helpful. Um, but in the end, we're gonna have to monitor this, you know, and and it's the real question, who's gonna monitor? And is this ever within the capacity of governments to monitor or do we need some other mechanism? I mean, I think that's gonna be the big question more than the precise standards where I doubt there's gonna be all that much, um, you know, disagreement. Let me, let me push back slightly on that point because sure. one concern I have just from a technological perspective is that, any sort of speech moderation standard is going to require the deployment of technologies where the you know op, where the service has visibility into what people are saying, which makes it which basically rules out the sort of end-to-end -end encryption we rely on with services like Signal and things of that nature. So, how do, would you tackle the encryption quandary and the question about you know how a service provider that doesn't want to have the ability to look at what's being said on its platform at all uh, can handle that? Especially, you know, service providers in the U U.S. that are increasingly skeptical of how their platforms will be commandeered by U.S. law enforcement. 
Yeah, okay, I, I believe very much in end-to-end -end encryption. I, I would oppose any effort to undermine that for law enforcement purposes. And, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't think that's the real problem. In other words, if they wanted to limit, say, the number of people to whom you could disseminate your WhatsApp message, you know, so that it, it's harder to make things go viral, you know, I, I could live with that, but not with, you know, cutting through the end-to-end -end encryption on some theory that you're gonna have to fight hate speech. I mean, hate speech isn't a problem in, in small doses. You know, hate speech becomes a problem if it, you know, if it really does go viral. And so I think that the, you know, the way to deal with, you know, something like WhatsApp or Telegram is to just limit, you know, numbers of dissemination. It could still go viral person to person to person, but it's it's a bit harder. But if you, you know, if you look at, you know, what really is forcing things to go viral, it's public platforms. It's not end-to-end -end description. You know, it, it's Twitter, it's Facebook, it's you know Instagram. So it's um, TikTok. I mean, these are not encrypted; they're public. You know, so I, I think that that's where the real problem is. Let me bring another question from the um, audience. Um, so the question is: What could those of us who develop technologies do to enhance human rights advocates' capabilities? So what are you? If you, in a, in a way, if you had a list of wishes, Ken, for the for for the creators of technology, what would be, what can they do for you? I mean, look, I, you know, probably Albert's in a much better place to answer this question, but I, I will venture an answer, which is that you know, I feel that we are um, stymied by the proprietary nature of a lot of the things that we're trying to study. You know, particularly the the algorithms that are promoting, um, you know, certain posts, and. I think you know technological experts, insofar as they could help us get behind those algorithms. And I I suspect there's you know something between you know what is the really secret sauce, the proprietary thing that you know Facebook needs to keep secret, versus other things that we we can look at to test whether they are trying you know whether they are engaging you know in promoting hate speech or or misinformation or things that you know may be profitable. But are just wrong to be promoting, and and I, you know, so I'm not enough of a tech expert at all to be able to draw that line. But I suspect that there is a line that is, you know, far more revelatory than than um, the platforms currently allow. I I want to turn to another line drawing exercise, and I was struck by when you were talking about privacy in public and the ways that you know the reasonable expectation of privacy framework we have in the, in the United States has really failed to keep up with the way our data is collected today. When you think about memorializing that sort of privacy standard, are there any natural lines that come to mind? Because you know, I think we can all agree that in the status quo, far too much of our data can be taken far too easily by the police without any protections. But it's, not, it, it's a lot harder to see where exactly you limit that or what what you make the new mechanism for defining what is considered you know private data yeah i mean i actually am, am you know a believer in the concept of probable cause and you know if if you i mean to take it outside of the technology realm for a moment you know i could be you know hiding my stolen bank funds over here in my living room you know um in the privacy of my home but if the police you know have probable cause, you know, facts giving rise to um, believe that it's more likely than not that I have stolen goods here, they can breach my privacy. They can come in with a search warrant and search my apartment and take those funds, you know? So I think we could think about something like that with respect to location data as well. You know, that if there really is reason to believe that a suspect, you know, was involved in a crime, um, you can, and, and you think that the location data is going to provide evidence, get a a search warrant effectively from a judge and you can take that data what i think becomes more problematic is where they say oh you know we need the haystack in order to find the needle um and and then suddenly you know all of our data is looked at just because somebody within that might have done something suspicious and you know maybe you can anonymize that so it doesn't affect us so much but that's what i worry about because it's just so easy for that data to be misused. You know, once it's in a government computer, how do you prevent it from being misused for other reasons? And, you know, this was, you know, this was really Snowden's revelation. I mean, you know, it kind of woke us up to all of this, um, but I don't feel it's really been solved. 
I should just say as a quick bit of background for the non-lawyers in the audience, the vast majority of electronic data in the United States can be taken by police with a subpoena, which is a much lower level of legal process, or it can be purchased with no legal process whatsoever. Right. No, and I mean, a subpoena is nothing. A subpoena is just a piece of paper that somebody signs, you know, so it's like that is no review. And obviously you can just, you can go to the company and say, give it to me and, you know, buy it. Um, but I think that's why we need rules. You know, and I, I think for us, for our privacy really to be safe, you do want, you know, somebody to have to go to a judge and say, these are the facts that lead me to believe that there's evidence of a crime here. Now, can I conduct a search? Um, that's how we've been protected up until now. It shouldn't be different just because the, you know, private information is in electronic rather than physical form. So speaking of questions from the audience that I'm just going to read to you, the question is, uh, do you foresee the use of reconstructions as evidence in future atrocities trials, for instance, before the ICC? I mean, yes, although, you know, with a caveat in that you've got to be clear that it's a reconstruction. So, you know, we're not saying this is the reality. It's not a picture, but it's an effort, you know, based on actual evidence to allow people to visualize it. And I think with that caveat, as long as you're completely clear about what it is, that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, and and you know, it just it it's it's not all that different from if you go in a courtroom and you're before the jury and you have a chart showing you know that the person moved here or there. I mean, the chart you know, it, it's not um, it's not a picture, but it helps you kind of understand the evidence that's been presented. And I think visualization is the same thing. Mm -hmm. And, and on that note, I, I, you know, we see a lot of investment in augmented reality and virtual reality as, you know, emerging platforms. Do you think those will become just as vital to sort of the work of human rights advocates? I mean, probably, although I have to say we haven't gone there yet because it's still so clunky, you know, and while, you know, some people don't mind putting on the headset and most people just, it drives them crazy. So um, it hasn't been a step we've taken yet. Um, that we, we've, you know, thought about it, um, and maybe the technology gets simpler so you don't have to wear this clunky headset, but for now, I don't see it taking off. And let me get you one last question from the audience, uh, which is then also the last question for the hours. And so this question is, how is censorship by private governments, for example, corporations, any better than censorship by public governments, e.g. nations? Can one manage legal speech on social media without censoring? That's another question by Bob Wyman. Okay, well, I mean, can you manage without censoring? Yes. In other words, there's too much talk about just taking stuff down. And, and I, I feel, you know, if, if somebody puts up a hateful post and it just sits there, nobody sees it, you know, it's not a big problem. But if it gets promoted by the algorithm, that becomes a problem. And so I, you know, am much more interested in, in regulating the algorithm so that it's not actively spreading the hateful or false information than I am about taking it down. And um, I, I, you know, usually we, I mean, at least for me, the term censorship means, you know, you take it down. And I don't think for the most part, that's what we're talking about. I mean, I'm really much less concerned with that. Um, the, you know, the issue of, I mean, I, I do think we're in this anomalous position where these private companies are managing so much of the public square. And, and we're used to thinking, you know, about whether it's constitutional rights or human rights as things that really just limit the government, that they don't apply to private corporations. And this, um, you know, it's not entirely satisfactory because the private corporations are playing a kind of quasi-governmental role. But it also, I think, does allow us to um, be a bit more refined in our response. I, you know, I think governments would have a hard time you know, say the U.S. government under the First Amendment um, saying, you know, we want to downplay this hateful speech, you know, because in the U.S., I mean, the Constitution is very deferential towards speech and, and mere advocacy of violence is actually protected. You've got to go so far as to incite violence, you know, to have sort of almost no um, space between the word and the conduct for it to be legitimately suppressed by the government. Um, that's too high a standard. Um, for for private companies. So I think we do have, you know, a bit more leeway here, but there is this question of, well, who are these companies and how are they accountable and they have so much power and, you know, are we now being, you know, run by Elon Musk? And and so there is, um, you know, I mean, Facebook moved toward this oversight board, but it really, you know, 
has, I think, limited capacity to do much of anything. We need something that is um, more dynamic and um, is listened to. Um, and I, you know, I don't know what that is, but we, this is a, a governance gap that exists right now. Thank you. Um, so we are at the end of our hour. Um, we have learned a lot here. Uh, we have learned a lot about the dangers that come uh, with technology, the potential that uh, technology has for both private sector companies and abusive governments to assert themselves over uh, the rights of um, customers, citizens, human beings. Uh, but we've also seen that there's a lot of potential uh, for civil society actors, for those human beings, for citizens to actually fight back against that, uh, to hold government accountable. Uh, and one thing that's become clear here is uh, nothing in that domain will just fall into place. Uh, it requires uh, a human agency. It requires people to do th things. And definitely something we can take away from this discussion that this requires an active interest by, uh, at the very least, an active interest uh, by quite a lot of us, uh, and uh, much more than an active interest, namely serious engagement by a, a dedicated subset of those people to actually make sure that technology works works out in favor of human rights causes than, than against them. And, and in that spirit, thank you, Ken Roth, for, uh, for this terrific talk. And thank you, Albert, for, for joining me and moderating this. And thank you to the audience for being here uh, with us. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.